Welcome back to Little Guys, the show about little computers that are trying their best, which I've been making a lot of lately because this year's summer is really hot, and it turns out that studios also get hot when they don't have air conditioning. My home office, on the other hand, does, so I'm kind of stuck here. I'm hoping to do something about that next year, but for now, you'll be seeing me at the bench until the next cool day comes along. I will be doing things other than little guys, but admittedly, I have a lot of them to get through. So, today's guy is at least actually little for once. Uh, this machine comes from intrepid Canadian graphics experts Matrox. Uh, it's the Foresight 2, you know, the sequel to the original Foresight. And at first glance, this seems pretty basic. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a cute little... Uh, rectangular prism, but uh, what's there to write home about? You got your DVI, your VGA, your Parallel, your USB. Just another bland episode of Little Guys, I guess. The most interesting thing on display here is the label DVI-V, because there's no such thing, just DVI-A, I, and D. No bloody A, B, C, or D. But I have no deeper insight into that, so what else we got? Well, there's nothing on the top or sides. Oh, on the bottom, we've got an XP Embedded sticker. I mean, at least it's not the other Windows Embedded. That would be truly dreadful. But either way, this isn't looking too remarkable. And then you turn it around and things get a bit zestier. Okay, so the big bank of digital I.O. pins is something we're starting to get used to in this series, I think. But the fact they appear to be removable, that's novel. More significantly, what's with the enormous 44-pin connector labeled Video In? Uh, now, we've seen a machine with a video capture card before, uh, two of them, actually, but this seems to have 22 of them. So, things are heating up. And indeed, I picked this particular gadget because it has an interesting function and it's a good representation of a divide in the world of guys that I haven't talked much about. The basic requirements for a little guy are that A, the hardware is PC-based, not ARM or anything. Uh, B, it is in some way not a typical PC form factor. I think that counts. Uh, and three, it was never sold openly to consumers, only to businesses. Now, plenty of computers meet these recs. I've got about 50 at this point. It's, it's kind of getting absurd. But within this very broad category, there are some additional genres. And one of the most basic divisions is whether a machine is generic or not. For instance, uh, here's a sneak peek of a later episode. This device was sent to me by one of my viewers. Shout outs to Robert, thank you so much. And the actual episode would be pretty cool, I think, so I don't want to spoil too much, but he told me where it was being used and what it was doing. And as far as I can tell, it was just running a normal copy of Windows with a program installed that talked to some process control machinery over the serial port. Uh, in other words, there's nothing about this specific device that was tailored to that job. Everything that's on here is a normal PC interface. We've got uh, in USB, HDMI, Ethernet. These are nothing special. They're just uh, little drive cages. There's uh, nothing whatsoever on the other side. This is just a computer. They could have used a laptop with three USB serial adapters. It technically would have worked. Now, obviously, uh, there would have been reliability issues with that. They picked this big chungus, presumably because it's rugged, it's entirely passively cooled, so there's no fans to fail. It could be trusted to turn on immediately when you plug in power, and it's got three built-in serial ports, so you don't need to worry about your cheap USB dongles failing. So it's meant for industrial use, but not any specific industry. This was made by a company called OnLogic, who specialize in this kind of thing. They just sell a bunch of standard models like any other computer company. Uh, in fact, I just recently obtained another machine that's um, <laughs> pretty clearly also made by them, except if we take a look at the bottom, that's a weird way to spell on logic. Uh, this has been debadged and relabeled as a Panasim Enterprise Edition. And I can barely find out what those were meant to do, but I have fired it up. It's just a program running on Linux. I'm pretty sure it just talks over the network. So this machine was also not custom made for Panasonic. It's just an off the shelf unit with no special parts. Unless you want to count the literal actual crystal fonts LCD on the front. <laughs> Turns out those haven't changed in over 20 years. But anyway, um, the point is, almost all the machines on this series to date are just um, computers. You could use them for anything. They're utterly generic, and that makes them uh, type one little guys, if you will. Okay, here's another type. This is PC hardware that's actually built into something, like integrated into it. Uh, for instance, this uh, voicemail module that we saw in the last episode, this only fits in one specific phone system. It would never work in anything else, and you wouldn't want to put it in anything else. It's made for that one purpose. 
But in between those categories, we've got devices like the Foresight. You would never buy this as just a PC to do whatever with. It's designed from the ground up for one specific task, but it's not that specific. I mean, the, the Foresight is a generic solution for a type of problem. And in fact, Matrox made a whole bunch of them that are all fairly interchangeable. I wasn't joking. This really is the sequel to the first Foresight. Uh, the model line started back in 1999, I believe, and it's still going. The latest one I'm aware of came out in 2019, after which uh, Matrox's Machine Vision Division, I'll say that five times fast, uh, got sold to Zebra, because that makes sense. But um, what is this machine vision I speak of? Well, I'm not qualified to tell you the full answer because it comes in so many forms, but there's a great example in basically any food-oriented episode of how it's made. Uh, if it's potato chips, for instance, once they go through the fryer, there'll be a chamber with a bright light and a camera that takes high-speed photos and sends them to a computer. Uh, they're then analyzed in software, which compares every chip to a reference image. If one looks burnt or underdone, it's automatically blown into the trash. Uh, and I also found an episode where a camera locates frozen pretzels on a conveyor belt and uses that to tell a robot arm where to grab them, which is a great example, but I picked it because it was very funny. Anyway, um, machine vision is a huge space. I've only just scratched the surface, but it mostly comes down to uh, feeding photos into a computer and having it draw factual conclusions from them. Now, obviously, some of these tasks are going to require heavy duty parallel processing. I'm sure the industry was thrilled when CUDA came out, but in a lot of cases, it's not that heavy a lift. Uh, comparing two low resolution 2D images just isn't that hard, especially if you're just looking for black spots. So a normal computer can often handle it, but you still need some special capabilities. The Foresight 2 is from about 2001, as far as I can tell, and it is indeed just uh, an ordinary PC with no dedicated high-performance silicon that I know of, because consumer-grade CPUs were getting pretty fast at this point. But you still have to get the data into the computer to analyze it, and you need a way to let the computer act on what it sees, and those seem to be the biggest features on this thing. Uh, for instance, uh, starting with the 44-pin uh, connector, I quipped that it was for connecting 22 cameras, but that's not true, of course. It only accepts 12. Uh, per the pamphlet, this port connects to a high-powered frame grabber called the Matrox Orion. Uh, frame grabber, by the way, is basically an industrial term for a capture card. I don't think there's any meaningful distinction between the two. And a typical 2001 consumer capture card would do standard def video, NTSC or PAL, over composite, S-video, component, maybe RGB if it was really high-end, but that was about it. And as far as I can tell, the Orion was also limited to those formats, but Matrox lists a lot of other options. And one of my faves is Firewire. Uh, DV cameras were extremely popular and pretty high quality by 2001, and the Foresight will accept up to three of them. Oh, they should have called it the Three Sight. This is nuts. I've never seen that many Firewires on any one computer in my life. I mean, if they had a PCI card, sure, but never built in, I don't think. Uh, but it gets better. Consumer Firewire cameras used DV, but that codec was actually intended for use on tape, so it was heavily compressed to achieve a 25 megabit data rate. Industrial Firewire cameras used a different protocol called IIDC, which could deliver uncompressed digital video at... I actually can't get any results when I Google what bitrate it used, so I'm guessing it was device-specific, and FireWire went up to 400 megabits, so use your imagination. Uh, this, by the way, is why the Apple iSight can't be plugged in any standard DV equipment, because uh, for some reason, Apple designed it as an IIDC device. Uh, the more you know. So this is all fun, but it's pretty standard stuff. Uh, from there, however, we veer into much stranger formats. You could capture digital video over RS-422, LVDS, or Camera Link. Uh, now, LVDS I know, but the others are totally new to me. And finally, they list Composite RS-170 slash CCIR, and only one of those barely rung a bell. I had to look it up. Um, you know the terms NTSC and PAL? Uh, those aren't actually names of video systems, they're color systems that were bolted on to existing black and white television standards. And those standards were never really given coherent names, and by the time anybody cared about that, the color components were universal, so we just adopted the names of the color systems. But, if you want to refer to black and white American TV formally, apparently EIA calls it RS-170, and CCIR is the name of the standards body that created PAL before it was PAL, so RS-170 and CCIR. Weird. But um, why does any of this even matter? Who's doing black and white video in 2001? <laughs> Answer, anyone who needs precision imaging where color isn't vital. 
Uh, an image sensor without a Bayer filter array has higher light sensitivity and thus less noise, uh, less potential moiré, and possibly more luma resolution. I'm not sure about that part. And later in this video, I'll show you exactly what this was being used for, and you'll see that color wasn't essential. But uh, getting back to the Orion, since it uh, seems to be sort of the default for this thing, uh, it appears to have been a follow-up to the Matrox Meteor 2, and that one was sold as a plain PCI card. I'm going to have to buy one of those at some point. Uh, it had that same 44-pin connector. It broke out to 12 separate camera inputs, and I actually found a cable for this on eBay. I almost ordered it, but it was 100 bucks, and it just seemed a bit much, and this will turn out to have been the right decision, as you'll see shortly. But despite all those inputs, it only had one digitizer. It was sitting behind a 12 to 1 MUX, or multiplexer, which is a, a fancy term for a switch. So, in other words, you could indeed connect 12 cameras, but it could only capture from one at any given moment. And I think the Orion works the same way. So, uh, that's a bit disappointing, but consider what's the point in grabbing all 12 images if you can only process one at a time. This is not, after all, a parallel computing powerhouse. It shipped with either a Pentium 3 or a Celeron, both single core designs, and it didn't include a lot of RAM or any other special hardware. It's really not a very powerful machine. Although, the pamphlet does state that it has a Matrox G450 graphics chip, and that is intriguing. I, I, I mean, it makes sense given who made it, but it's still weird to think about. Uh, if you're younger than me. Uh, you might not remember that Matrox were a real up-and-comer in the GPU space for a bit. They were actually trying to compete with AMD and NVIDIA for a while, but like so many other graphics companies, they just couldn't quite hack it. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, so this is a Matrox Millennium, uh, the first one, not the second one. This is from 1996, so it's roughly contemporary with the Voodoo 1, and it does indeed offer 3D acceleration, but no texture mapping. <laughs> Apparently this can only do smooth shaded polygons. I mean... Okay, this was 1996, 3D accelerators barely existed, and the ones that did were mostly trash that literally did not work correctly. If you've never been through Vintage3D.org, I highly recommend the experience. It, it's just, it's a carnival ride. So things sucked back then, but it's still amazing that Matrox bothered releasing this. Uh, now, they quickly followed it up with much better cards, but I, I don't think any were ever serious competitors. I remember people being excited about the Parhelia for a hot minute. That was supposed to be their big comeback, but it was a massive disappointment, and that was pretty much the end for them in the consumer market. Nonetheless, the uh, G450 in here is a genuine 3D accelerator. It runs over AGP 2X. It supports DirectX 7 or 8, I think, so it should actually be able to run some 3D games more or less competently. We are going to try that, of course, but... 3D was not actually the point. Matrox included the G450 to do uh, video overlay, scaling, and multi-head output. Uh, the latter really had been their bread and butter for a long time. They made some very early dual-head cards, as well as a long-running series of single to multi-screen converters, like the Triple Head to Go. Uh, I think they're still around making cards with like ridiculous numbers of monitor connections on them, like no serious 3D capabilities, just loads and loads of display ports. I think they also had native TV output before ATI and NVIDIA did, but don't quote me on that. Um, however, that is an interesting point, because the Foresight's pamphlet says it has TV output, yet there's no, no S-Video, no composite, nothing like that. It's simply going through the second VGA port. So presumably there was an adapter cable that used a couple reserved pins to sneak a composite signal uh, onto that port. Weird way to do it if you're making a custom chassis anyway, why not just punch one more hole in there? But um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, getting back to the device's actual purpose, uh, once you've got your analog or digital cameras hooked up, uh, you would write some software that connects to each camera in turn, uh, grabs an image, does whatever analysis it needs, and then does something based on the result. And that's probably where the uh, digital I.O. comes in. If we want to get rid of bad potato chips, we need to open solenoids to fire air jets to launch them off the conveyor belt. Uh, these optically isolated I.O. pins would connect to the relays that control those solenoids. Uh, the optical isolation is important because because well, you get stuff like um, magnetic pulses from the relays closing. You know, you could get too much voltage uh, shoved in here. You don't want to potentially blow up the rest of the computer. We'll talk more about that when we take the thing apart later. Uh, and these go both ways. Uh, they can output, but they can also input, because, of course, you'd uh, want to read like an optical sensor that tells you if the burnt chip bin is full, so you can set off an alarm with another pin that tells somebody to come empty it, that sort of thing. And as far as I know, that is uh, basically what this thing is for. There are a million ways it could get used, but that's the extent of the actual customization. Otherwise, it's just a normal PC, which is, of course, what fascinates me about these things. So 
Now's a good time to fire it up and demonstrate that, but as typical for little guys, they couldn't just use a normal power plug. So we gotta get one of these godforsaken four pin not din things. Uh, fortunately, however, I baked one before the show. Unfortunately, I did a half ass job of it. I hate these things. The machine takes 12 volts. The device outputs 12 volts. Now kiss. Well, unfortunately, uh, there's many different ways to configure these four pins to deliver just one voltage, and naturally nobody ever agrees. Uh, so when I got this power supply, uh, the 12 volts was on the top with ground on the bottom, and here the 12 volts was also on the top and ground on the bottom, except that the connector is rotated 90 degrees. So if I hooked it up like that, it would have shorted out the power supply. So I had to chop it up and uh, play around with the wires, and I just stuck it back together with this Vago connector because I, I just don't have the patience to solder and, and shrink. But you know what? It works. Wow, that is a really loud fan, and now I have to talk over it the whole time. This keeps happening to me. Five minutes later. Hmm. Well, no picture, but also no numlock on the keyboard, and my mouse isn't active, so something's amiss. <laughs> Apparently I broke it. Crap. Two hours later. All right, after a trip to the store for snacks, namely a lemon-lime Gatorade and a stick of Ram, I think it's working again. Hey, there we are. All right, let's uh, pause. I said let's pause. There we go. So our BIOS was built in 2004, which means either this thing was sold for several years or it was updated. Either one uh, would fly. Uh, we've got a Celeron at 1.2 gigahertz, which is um, actually a bit quicker than I expected. I was figuring <laughs> half that speed. Uh, and then um, I happen to already know that it has 128 megs of memory in it because I just had to replace the memory. I don't know how much it had originally. I didn't make a note of it back when it was booting. Uh, this stick just decided to die uh, before I could get a picture. And uh, the numbers on it, well, I've tried Googling them and they don't turn up anything as was the case with RAM for some reason. For eons, they just, they refused to put any sort of meaningful label on it. I don't know why. How hard is it to just, just write the size that it is? Ugh. It's not like it's 30 pin Sims or something where the size differs depending on what machine you use it in. I mean, come on, they, they bothered to print a label. They know which RAM it is. Why not put the, we should move on. So it's a Pentium 3 class Celeron. Looks like the RTC is reset. I should probably replace the battery. Uh, looks like we have a diskette controller, although um, I'll show you later, but I never actually saw a connector in there for it. So I guess they just didn't bother turning that off. Well, now that I think about it, um, there's definitely not connectors for four hard drives in there either, but we'll, we'll get to that too. Actually, I guess, I guess there could be. Well, we'll talk about that later. I'm sorry, did I say 128 megs? <laughs> oh my God, I can't remember what I did 20 minutes ago. I put 256 megs in this thing. This is how good my memory is. By the way, I had to dig through a big bin to find 256 meg PC 100, because that's the only speed this thing will take. I tried 133, no dice. I tried 66, no dice. I probably could have dug harder and found a 512, but um, I don't think this thing needs it. I don't think there's anything particularly spicy in the BIOS. Oh, other than um, it does have the TV out options menu. Oh, and uh, you know what? This actually says outright that the TV encoder is on the VGA2 output port. Now I'm curious whether they reused the existing VGA pins uh, or if uh, they repurposed a couple pins that weren't being used for anything. Oh, this can actually do both S-Video and plain 15 kilohertz RGB. I hadn't expected that. Huh, so they must be using at least three pins. Um, there's not that many spare pins on the VGA connector, I don't think, so it's gotta be repurposing something. Well, we'll find out. Anyway, as I mentioned, the uh, built-in graphics are AGP, so this is actually correct, but what's intriguing here is uh, Matrox actually bothered to modify this BIOS. So it says, uh, select AGP to leave the graphic controller installed by Matrox as the default display device. Very few companies actually bother uh, to get their you know professional services at whatever company modded the BIOS for them uh, to go this far. Just a little uh, bit of extra craftsmanship they didn't need to do. I always respect that. Wait, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> Floppy controller on LPT port? Huh? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, okay, okay. So if you go back here and turn on legacy diskette A, 
which you'll notice only supports three and a half inch drives. That's weird. Most BIOSes continue to have the uh, uh, the five and a quarter inch options in there. But anyway, if you turn that on, then come back into IO device config, it has turned off the parallel port and the floppy controller is now enabled and it apparently runs over the parallel port. Whoa. Okay, I think that's custom. I, I think Matrox did that themselves. That is wacky. I mean, it's a brilliant solution um, insofar as uh, they probably shipped this thing with a floppy drive that plugged in there for, for loading software. And they probably had a support contract with pretty much every single customer that bought one. So if they needed one, they'd just call their rep and, and he'd ship one over. So it's not a big problem um, that it's definitely super proprietary. I've just never seen it before. Oh, and you know what else? I just noticed uh, serial port A has, you know, just enabled, disabled, and auto. Well, I, I guess I don't know what auto does. But anyway, serial port B also has the option to be switched to RS-485 because that's very popular in industrial applications. Okay, I lied. This BIOS is actually kind of full of surprises. Oh, I should mention the um, USB to PS2 keyboard emulation. I'm glad it has it because there's no PS2 ports. Uh, but it sucks. Uh, it keeps dropping inputs. Yeah, see how sometimes it just doesn't? It just doesn't. Oh, and there's also a fan speed control in here. Huh. You know, I have not tried turning that down. That's probably not going to take effect till I restart the machine, though. Are there any other mysteries in here? I think we've seen everything that's unique to the system. Oh, you can, um, you can actually just arbitrarily downclock the CPU. That's cute. This is also interesting. Max boot failure. Uh, if it fails to boot three consecutive times, then it'll uh, just default the BIOS automatically. That's cool. It's, um, it's kind of like a watchdog. Neato. That's probably really common on other machines and I just haven't noticed it. Oh, and sure enough, uh, graphics controller Matrox G450. So uh, we're definitely gonna get a, a proper accelerator on this thing. Hooray. Okay, well, um, let's restart this thing and see if my VGA craps out since I turned on the TV output. Oh wait, no, that would be on um, port number two. So that's not gonna happen. Okay, no big deal then. Um, once this thing boots up, uh, I might probe around and see if I can find the composite signal on there. I wanted to mention, by the way, uh, while this has DVI, and I could adapt that to HDMI uh, and get a much better, <laughs> cleaner capture, I tried that. And uh, what happened is it would just, the screen would flash over and over, and it would never, like, lock in. So I guess it didn't like something about the adapter or the monitor that I connected. I don't know. But I will say that uh, changing the setting for the, um, uh, the TV output appears to have changed the scan rate of the VGA output, because I had this dialed in, and now it looks like crap. Let me um, turn that back off and see if it puts it back the way it was. Wow, the uh, the legacy keyboard emulation is a hundred times worse than the last time I tried it. What the hell is going on? You know what it probably is? It probably doesn't like this keyboard because these, uh, these Lenovo uh, Silk or whatever they call them are for some reason, um, uh, composite USB devices. They show up as multiple things and I have no idea why that is. I should get rid of this. I'm not sponsored by Gatorade. Wow, the uh, USB keyboard isn't working any better in here. So uh, something I did really hosed it up. Oh, wow, weird. Uh, rebooting made the, the keyboard behavior change. It's sort of back to the, the sort of bad that it was before. The video is still messed up, though. And sure enough, turning off TV output put it back the way it was. So I guess when you do that, it changes the scan rate of uh, the native VGA output. That's, um, wow, that's just really weird. Well, anyway, moving on, uh, these are our boot options. It still has the original hard drive. We've got a free DOS interpreter for who knows what reason, uh, and then a copy of XP Embedded. But uh, for some reason, it actually specifies on the boot menu that um, I, I think this means that Windows itself is getting 248 megs of system RAM, and then MIL gets eight megs. I have no idea what MIL is. <laughs> Well, if I look up XP embedded MIL memory, so I didn't specify Matrox at all, uh, it starts coming up with results from Matrox, including one that says uh, Matrox imaging library software. Now, I'm not opposed to the idea that this has some sort of driver that allows it to permanently reserve eight megs of system memory uh, just for use by the Matrox software, you know, to guarantee that the OS cannot possibly reclaim it for any other purpose, because um, this is a, uh, 
I think a hard real-time application would be the right definition, where um, if this thing is supposed to be looking at, you know, a potato chip assembly line, as the chips are going by, it needs to be able to answer whether a chip is good or bad within, you know, 40 or 50 milliseconds or something. If it can't do it just like that every single time reliably, then um, when it finally goes, okay, I got the answer, you know, two seconds later, the chip is way down the line and it's too late to uh, get rid of it. Now, I believe 8 megs of memory is enough space for at least a couple of standard definition bitmaps, uh, so I'm kind of thinking that's what it's for, to guarantee that the, uh, the software can never run into memory allocation problems, but I don't actually know, and maybe it's something uh, far more generic. Anyway, let's uh, try and boot this, and hopefully, <laughs> once we do, the keyboard will start working better. Hmm, the mouse is not working yet, and that's making me, um, oh, wait, oh, there we go. I was worried the USB legacy uh, peripheral emulation was uh, causing problems, but uh, no, I think we're fine now. So as mentioned earlier, uh, this runs XP embedded, which is basically Windows XP with parts cut out, or, or sometimes parts added, although honestly I see that less often. As soon as it boots, uh, all the software fires up. <laughs> board driver started successfully. Smile. I have no idea which board that's referring to, by the way, but we'll, uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, so it seems the main program on here was this thing called B Automation SurePack, and I'm not 100% sure what that was. The company seems to have been dead for a very long time, uh, and their website was hideously outdated even when this program was in production. I'll speculate later on exactly what this app did, but it's moot because, well, uh, error occurred while allocating imaging library. ruh -roh. Okay, so, so... I shot a much longer and more confusing version of this video where I did a lot of meandering and guesswork and then ultimately concluded that whoever decommissioned this thing ripped out the video digitizer. And that means none of the software on here will launch since it can't detect the card. And that's a huge disappointment to me. I mean, I don't have a factory or a camera rig or, or anything that it needs, but I'm sure I could have bodged something together, you know, uh, poked some wires into the port, gotten it to show us an image, and that would have been mildly titillating, but no such luck. The bastards who sold this thing knew what they had. How rude. But don't worry, the show isn't over. You'll see some cool shit. Barely interesting shit, but I promise it'll be worth it. Anyway, the error message tells us to go look at the event log. Uh, but I tried this before, and I'm not sure what it wants us to look at, because there ain't much in here. Hmm, I have no idea what CSNW was. Oh right, that was the band that Neil Young was in for a bit. They had some good songs, and they were a bit less dorky than ELO. This joke doesn't work, they were different eras. Anyway, to its credit, there are, um, an awful lot of errors in the event log. Like, an awful lot of errors, and some of these seem, uh, pretty dire indeed. Like, uh, we keep getting this, um, message from the Orion module that says error occur when getting PCI configuration. That, well, yeah, that does seem like it would be a problem. Here's a trouble, though. Uh, we've been getting errors like that going back this thing's entire service life, it looks like, because there are messages going back to 2005, and they still show that exact same message from the Orion module. Uh, and I'm sure that this thing wasn't just sitting in a closet the whole time. You know, th this, this would have been when it was brand new. Uh, and there's six continuous years of logs here, so it wasn't just turned on once and then put away, you know... This was clearly running in whatever condition it's currently in. So, um, yeah, I don't think any of these messages mean anything. However, there are a couple interesting ones I'd like to point out. Uh, for instance, the MTX4S2. No idea what that means. No Google results. However, it appears to be part of a watchdog system. It's very likely this machine has a hardware watchdog. And if I had installed just like a plain copy of Windows on here, it might just be rebooting over and over right now because nothing's feeding the dog. So, um, thank you, whoever didn't wipe this thing. Uh, also, I like this message from Serial. It's so strangely worded. No parameters subkey was found for user-defined data. This is odd. Yeah, that is odd for a Microsoft internal error message. This seems to actually be part of Windows. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the logs are not terribly useful. Let's take a peek at the start menu. There's uh, not much in here. So the BD automation folder, that just has two things. Obviously, um, there's SurePack as well, but, well, we saw what happens when you try to start that. Uh, so the other stuff on here is something called BDA Fire Tower and Visionary I.O. Tester. Neither one does much. I don't know what Fire Tower is supposed to mean, uh, but the app seems to be just a simple camera viewer. It complains on startup about not finding a camera, uh, but then when you get to the window, it appears to just be like you pick a camera, you can, you can view the current image, you can save an image. Uh, nothing terribly involved here. 
The other app appears to be for testing the uh, I.O. pins on the back of the machine. And this thing seems to have been thrown together in a real hurry. Uh, first off, on this screen where you set which pins are, are inputs and outputs, um, they start numbering at pin 0 and go to 15. But when we hit set, on this screen they're numbered from 01 to 16. <laughs> Also, it says you can uh, double click a status box to change its value. Oh, oh, it's working now. Hey, now I tried this before and it didn't work. Dang it. Oh my God. I just discovered the whole thing uh, has a huge off by one error. This is going to mess up a later part of my script, isn't it? I was messing with this earlier and um, I, I set one pin to an output and I tried toggling it uh, in this dialog here and it wouldn't do anything. And I concluded that the... Um, uh, the thing just just didn't work, uh, but I think it really is numbered starting at zero, and this entire dialogue is shifted by one. So um, I've just set pins, well, probably four and five, I'm guessing, to on. So let me uh, let me find a ground here. Okay, so nothing down there seems to have voltage. However, I've been thinking about this. These uh, might be isolated from the rest of the system. So let's try this. Okay, nothing across the two pins. What about here? Nothing there. Okay, so that's my other theory then, that this doesn't actually output like TTL levels, that they're just switch closures. Um, I'll show you why I think that later when we take it apart. We don't even know if this thing is actually... Oh, there we go. They could not have engineered this thing better to make it hard to stick probes in there. On, off, on, off. Bed goes up, bed goes down. Bed goes up, bed goes down. Absolutely delightful. And um, in that case, I can probably get this to read a value too. Oh wait, no, because I don't have um, I, I don't have a, a source of voltage. The inputs aren't going to be uh, just switch closures like that, right? They're going to require um, a positive voltage applied to them to trigger. Because uh, I tried this earlier, I tried just uh, bridging a couple of these pins together, and nothing happened. And um, I don't have another source of voltage to safely put in here. So uh, ah, ding dang. Although, what am I talking about? I'm not going to use this for anything. Let's just give it a shot. Five American Waltz. Oh, hang on. Why don't I be smart about this? You can't see it right now, but trust me, there's a current regulated bench power supply uh, above my workstation here. Let's just dial this bad boy down to nothing. All right, that's uh, 270 milliamps. Let's go lower. There we go. That's like 60 milliamps. Let's try that. Okay, do I see any? Okay, no significant current draw. Oh, oh, it's on. That actually worked. I didn't really expect it to. And now it's off. These are all isolated from each other, so you gotta put both sides on the same input. I didn't mention this earlier, but there's 16 IO ports, but each one is two pins, because they're all uh, self-contained. There's no common ground or anything, for what I think are probably obvious reasons. Well, that's terrific. Um, I had messed with this twice before and didn't get it working, and it's all because um, the software for testing it is broken. <laughs> Fun fact, by the way, my bench supply is set to uh, an incredibly low value, probably like uh, 60, 70 milliamps. Uh, and I hook it up here. Nothing happens. I hit refresh. And then I hear the supply's current uh, control relays drop. So like the act of clicking refresh here is causing something to happen at uh, the interface. I don't know what that would be, right? Like, you know what? Actually, I wonder if there's something scanning these inputs, but only when pulled. So maybe when I hit refresh, it it actually does attach a very light load uh, to every pin in turn. And that might be just enough to um, punch the current above the threshold. Hmm. Interesting question. If I had the right kind of equipment, I could actually check this. But um, the only resistance measuring device I have is definitely not fast enough to notice that. So yeah, this program's a real piece of crap. Um, you can kind of, you can kind of tell this is a wham bam weekend project, but whatever. It probably got the job done. The only other app on here is called Intellicam, and this turns out to be uh, official Matrox software, and it looks very exciting. Uh, for just a moment, whoa, whoa, wait, hang on, this didn't happen before. Yo, what's what's going on? Um, every time I ran this before, this window would appear for just a moment and then evaporate. And I've never seen the window behind it. I have no idea what's going on right now. Um, okay, well, um, let's just roll with it. So uh, this is a list of every possible Matrox video capture device that this thing supports. Uh, something I'd like to point out is that there's no, there's no Firewire devices in here. 
but it does mention a Meteor 2 1394 virtual device. Actually, these are all virtual devices, right? So these are presumably simulations of various um, Matrox equipment. If we actually had the capture card, and as I said, we don't, uh, I'm sure it would show up in here, but instead you can presumably experiment uh, with emulated devices. But I guess this would mean uh, that the Meteor 2 had its own uh, built-in Firewire interface, which would make sense because I think it came out like uh, three or four years prior to this. But now the question I have to ask is if I were to plug in a DV camcorder, would it work? You know, the one real device here seems to be this. And I'm wondering if that's just going to get the, um, the actual video output. Let's see what Allocate does. Okay. Uh, oh, it created a VGA device zero. Make active. Okay, can we like, um, can we like grab an image here? I guess we'd have to hit new, wouldn't we? Ah, yes, there we go. Image attributes for processing, for grabbing, for display. I love it. Uh, okay, so we're creating a 640 by 480 8-bit image. Number of bands. No idea what that would be. I guess we could click help. Oh, come on. All right, whatever. Let's just make an image here. And then uh, can we... We still can't grab with DCF or, or digitizer, I guess, because we literally don't don't have a digitizer attached. But can we import? Hmm. No, that would import a file. Child area. I do actually know what this does, but I'll talk about it later. Yeah. So it looks like we can't import from like the um, uh, the video card, like I was hoping. You know, I was thinking maybe we'd be able to uh, just grab a screenshot. Let's flip over to one of these uh, virtual devices, though. Oh. I hit interpreter command one, that did something. Command two also did something. Command three did something. Oh, annotation text. Again, I actually do know what this stuff is um, a little bit anyway. I, I just hadn't planned to get to it till much later in the video. And also, oh my God, that is, that is a text editor, but it's very, very, very small. Oh, and these are the uh, commands that are being executed by these three buttons. Okay, uh, so let me explain. You remember earlier I mentioned uh, when we were looking at the boot menu that there was this MIL thing. So yeah, that is a real thing. It's the Matrox image library. It appears to be this absolutely enormous system of uh, image capture analysis and manipulation tools. And I'm going to show you some sample files that I found on the drive uh, that show how to use it. Um, but in short, uh, MIL has a thing called the uh, interpreter, which is a dedicated language just for doing uh, image manipulation operations. And it's got these commands, like for instance, um, mbuff clear, that's a uh, matrox buffer clear. So when I hit this first button here, uh, it just erases the contents of the buffer. And um, I'm going to assume that that 128 means it's gonna fill the entire buffer with a 50% uh, gray. Uh, and then this one here, this is histogram equalize. This is going to take the contents of the buffer and it's going to uh, equalize the uh, colored channels. Uh, and then this one down here, this writes some text using the uh, graphics routines. Uh, so it uses the uh, probably default font. And I just realized this is a token name. So every time you see this, this refers to the active image. So um, it's equalizing the histogram probably between two images. But in this case, it's just picking the, the primary buffer uh, twice. Uh, anyway, these are the X and Y coordinates of our text. Um, and then, well, well, <laughs> sort of ran out of space here and the window doesn't resize, but you can see it's going to write annotation text there. So, okay, well, this is super cool. The question is, how do I make the font in the interpreter window bigger? Because <laughs> I can't see anything. How did this happen? It's not like we're on Windows 10 where you can have DPI scaling issues. This is so weird. This, this program is acting like it's running on a screen that's the wrong resolution, but that's just... It, it can't possibly be. We're at 1024 by 768. Okay, well, anyway, I just realized that this is still set to a VGA virtual device. So let's get rid of this buffer. Now we have Orion virtual device selected. So let's create a new, oh, here we go. Uh, this is creating a new digitizer buffer. Oh, and this lets us select whether we're doing um, RS-170, CCIR, NTSC, or PAL. So those are the formats that the Orion supports. Uh, and then we've got the same settings for the image here. So we'll do an NTSC image. Oh, here are all the settings we would get if this was a real card. And it looks like they sold the Orion by itself because there's a separate uh, entry here for the Foresight version of it. Wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. So it looks like we can name our cameras. We can select whether they're frame scan or line scan. So this supports line scan cameras, which um, if you're not familiar, uh, the sort of linear one line CCDs that get used in uh, flatbed scanners, among other things. Well, you can mount one of those above a conveyor belt. 
And as things travel down the belt, it just takes a picture of the thing one line at a time. You see where I'm going here? They're very popular in machine vision applications where you don't need the whole image uh, literally instantaneously. So this supports that, although for some reason I can't pick it, probably because I would need to be in one of the other signal modes. I don't know what a tap is. I think that has something to do with how the image is digitized. I vaguely recognize that term. And we can only select one camera. I guess this um, virtual device only simulates one. Anyway, um, it looks like you can adjust an enormous number of values in the analog uh, side of the device. Uh, I have never seen this many adjustments in a capture card. This thing is uh, incredibly flexible. Oh, and this is how you would control your, um, your exposure time. Because when you're running a camera on a conveyor belt or something, you've got to have like a brake beam, like an optical sensor that detects when uh, the thing you're trying to photograph has moved into position to be photographed because things are not perfectly evenly spaced on, on most assembly lines. So um, as the box or, or bottle or whatever it is comes down the line, it hits a sensor and that sensor tells this thing, okay, time to take a picture. And this is probably how you do that because it's got configuration for um, whether the input is a TTL signal or something else, what polarity it is, how long it should be active, that sort of thing. Yeah, here we go. If we set this to a hardware trigger, there, now we can uh, choose what settings we want for that. So the exposure signal must literally be uh, actually for determining how long it should get exposed then. Because I notice these are timers rather than trigger signals. But if you just put it in continuous mode, then it's uh, probably just going to take pictures at, you know, uh, one thirtieth of a second intervals. Oh, wow. You can even set this thing up to like a gen lock to another signal. There's a lot going on here. I can't quite see the OK button. OK, we were actually at 800 by 600. Let's uh, adjust that and see if things get easier. Oh, I see. Um, I was supposed to pick image in the tab here. There we go. Now we have a buffer on Orion virtual device. Can we grab an image? No. <laughs> Call me naive, but I really thought it was going to let me take a picture. It was probably just going to give me a, a, you know, a test card or something, but uh, still would have been neat. All right. Well, at any rate, um, let me tell you what I think this program is for. This is a uh, diagnostics and experimentation interface. You wouldn't necessarily use IntelliCam for your day-to-day -day work, I think. Um, what you would do is you'd get in here and you'd use this interpreter um, that's, you know, a live interactive interpreter, like like typing Python at the command line, uh, to develop or, or to experiment with a process for uh, capturing and analyzing images. And then when you're done, you're going to save it as a script and you're going to call that script from something else. And as it happens, I know where some of those scripts are and I can show them to you. So let's go take a look. This is not going according to Keikaku, but it's actually better because I, I didn't get to look at that program at all the last time I shot this. I have no idea why it's running now. No idea. All right, so the Matrox software is extensive. There's um, a whole bunch of stuff in here, a bunch of drivers and um, uh, libraries and you name it. But if we dig down into a telecam and go to the inter folder, like I said, this is the uh, interpreter. And if we dig down into the examples folder, uh, these are all example scripts you can use to learn how to operate the things. So if we grab M search here, all right, so this is their uh, uh, presumably proprietary language. Um, I don't think CL is any, any standard lang, but uh, somebody will probably correct me. It's very lightly C-like. So we've got some macro definitions up here. Um, these are basically just constants. Uh, this is the image that's gonna be used, uh, I believe, as uh, the source, um, that is to say, this is going to be the reference image. This would be our um, our perfectly fried potato chip, for instance. Uh, so it's a 512 by 480 image. Uh, and then this defines what portion of that image we're going to be uh, comparing to. So we're not we're not going to match the whole thing. <laughs> we're going to match just the potato chip inside the frame. This is how close the uh, model needs to match. So when we search the, the target image, uh, it has to come within 70 points out of presumably 100 to count as a match. Then they declare all of our uh, working variables. Uh, this is gonna contain the output uh, from the search procedure. Then we start actually doing stuff. So we set the color uh, that our um, graphics drawing routines are gonna use when we draw lines and squares and whatnot. This limits how much of the image we're gonna process. Because if you take a whole photograph, you know, that's this big, but the potato chip is only filling up that part of it, and you know that's where it's going to be because that's where the brake beam sensor is, uh, then there's no reason to process the whole image, just wastes time. So you're always gonna window it whenever you can. This loads in the uh, model image. So we have our reference potato chip. Um, then we set our accuracy level. We set how quickly we wanna do the search. Presumably slower searches are more accurate. Then just to make it clear what we're matching to, uh, in the model image, we have it draw a box around the potato chip just for the, the user's benefit. This doesn't uh, affect how the thing actually processes, I'm sure. 
And then this is where the magic happens. MPAT find model looks for uh, the model in the sub image. That's the, uh, the photo we took with the camera. And it puts the result into the result variable. Uh, if there was anything uh, found, then uh, we execute all this code, uh, which basically draws a box around where it found the potato chip. And that's that. So that's that's your basic procedure. You could um, make some very light modifications to this and actually use it um, for your finished product. You could have this toggle an IO line um, every time a valid chip goes by and, and that's that. So you can see this MIL thing is incredibly powerful. If, if I had this working, I'd be able to actually leverage it right now. And uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, if we go into the uh, mill config uh, folder, run this guy here, this does in fact seem to have eight megs of RAM reserved for uh, MIL. And my guess is that this has a, a kernel module uh, that just reserves that memory and makes it available to any process using this thing's DLLs. You know, a normal user land program doesn't have permission to reserve a chunk of memory from the kernel, you know, no questions asked, right? So this, I think, is just a way to reliably get that that one chunk of memory reserved. And now that I think about it, uh, possibly to share it between processes, because uh, maybe you've got one process that's doing the capture and another that's doing the analysis. But if they have a chunk of memory that's shared, you know, back at the kernel level, uh, then they can both refer to it very easily. Total, total speculation. I'm just, you know, I'm saying things. But you know what isn't speculation? What this thing was actually used for. I actually know that for a fact. Uh, so, so far, we've just been looking at the C drive and there's not a whole lot there because it's actually only, uh, oh, two gigs. I was gonna say one gig, but that's way too small. Yeah, it's a two gig partition off of a uh, 30 gig hard drive. And that's because uh, this contains nothing more than the OS, the Matrox software, and some drivers. In other words, stuff that's universal to all four sites. But then, there's a second partition that takes up the rest of the drive, and that's a common practice for embedded machines because all user-specific data will be on that second partition. That means if the OS gets hosed, you can re-image the C drive, just blow it away and replace it with a stock image and not lose anything important. And sure enough, if we take a look at the D drive, hey, look at that, documents and settings. They relocated the user folder here, uh, so your, you know, my documents and your desktop and whatnot will persist through an OS reinstall. Now we also find the software from BD Automation. And uh, <laughs> y'all ready for this? Is it time for the percolator? You bet it is. Bam. I gotta maximize it. There we go, club air horns. That's right, this thing was identifying boxes of Quaker oats. And in fact, if we just uh, jump into the system control panel, yeah, th this was actually owned by Quaker Oats. So now we can guess exactly what this was doing. This would have been installed in one of two places. Uh, the output of a printing press to make sure that every box was printed correctly, or at the input to a boxing operation to make sure that each package looked right before it stuffed it with oats. Uh, and we've got four bitmaps in here. We've got original, we've got high fiber, we've got high fiber uh, cinnamon swirl, and then we have weight control with maple and brown sugar. Uh, so four varieties. And as I foreshadowed earlier, they are indeed black and white. Now that part particularly makes me think that this was installed in the final step of the process. Because obviously, you know, the printers would want to ensure that the colors are accurate, but the vital thing at the boxing stage is that nothing gets mislabeled. Uh, if you fill a plain oatmeal box with maple and brown sugar oats, someone could have an allergic reaction, not, not to mention just being disappointed. In comparison, a slightly off-color box is much less important at that stage in the process. So I think they would have focused on the best possible Luma accuracy here. I, I just absolutely love that um, we actually know the answer. This, this is precisely what this thing was used for. I never get this much satisfaction out of anything like this. I can only guess, but here, I know. Now, uh, we've got all these XML files in here, and uh, these actually define how these models will be used. Um, if we take a look at graphics.xml, this is the most important one. This identifies each one of the uh, models. So we've got regular and high fiber and so on. Uh, and it specifies which portion of the model is important and then which portion of the target image it wants it to compare to. So uh, presumably in this one here, it's only looking at that part. Whereas in this one here, it's only looking at this part. Like I said, Windows. And that's pretty much it. Um, the other XML files don't have much of note going on. Oh, I'm sorry, I did just notice something. I, I hadn't noticed this before because it's, uh, for some reason, it doesn't have an icon. That's a TIFF. Oh yeah, it's got a file association. I, <laughs> why didn't it have an icon? Uh, so this is a dark field calibration image. 
And if I remember correctly how this works, uh, you put a lens cap on your camera, you have it take a picture, and any uh, grain, any noise that's inherent to the sensor goes into this image, and then it gets automatically subtracted from all future images. Uh, likewise, we've got a gain correction. That's going to be the same thing, although I can't load it for some reason. Oh, and then here's the uh, bright field. Uh, this is the opposite. You have it, um, I, I think, expose with the uh, aperture all the way open uh, just for like four or five seconds till it's completely blown out, and then you look for any dark pixels. So you take this and the dark field, you add them to each other, and then you subtract the result from the uh, final image or, or whatever. I'm, I'm bad with numbers. You know, I've gotten enough surprises here that I'm now wondering... Oh man, could the actual software for this, for like authoring it, be on here? I don't think it is, uh, but there are some help files in here which I had not found before. Oh cool, the help file just tells you to call them <laughs> for a copy of the manual. <laughs> Bastards. Oh, but there's an installer here. That appears to be a service pack, that's probably already installed. So like I said, I, I don't know exactly what SurePack was, but uh, I can guess. So the Matrox Imaging Library offers a lot of very rich functionality from a programmer's perspective. <laughs> Wait, were those wingdings always there? But uh, on its own, you know, it's not something you can lay hands on, right? But it wouldn't take much to change that. So my guess is that SurePack was a very, very, very simplistic piece of software. Basically just like a, a Win32 app that just has a simple mouse interface for, you know, you grab an image, you draw a box around what you want to compare it to, and then you hit save, right? And it just generates those XMLs. Um, and then presumably this is not the authoring tool. It's just the, um, the program you run on the machine itself that's just going to sit there and do that over and over and over. So uh, it's a bummer that I don't have the authoring software. I sure wish I did. But honestly, I think we have a pretty good idea of what this was all about. So um, I, I think I'll survive. I gotta admit though, I am a little bit bummed. I may not have an assembly line, but you know, I can rig up a camera and modify the app into a, a troll doll detector. It just tells me when I am and I'm not holding a troll doll. Think about the possibilities. Okay, I'd like to move on to another topic, but first, real quick, I'm gonna plug in a DV camcorder and we're just gonna see, we're gonna see if it shows up in the software. Wouldn't that be wild? Uh, oh, this one will do. Flex? What's a flex? Now the question is, did I charge the battery? It kind of looks like I didn't. Wait, I think I have a power supply for this. Okay, there we go. Oh, this helps me install software for unknown. <laughs> Why would that be? It's just a DV device. There shouldn't really be a driver. Well, that's strange. Okay, well, um, Sony themselves say uh, that if this happens, you should restart Windows with the camcorder connected, and it should fix it. Sure, sure, you know what? I don't care. Why not? That shouldn't work, but um, nothing matters anymore. Peggle make phone calls. Big money, big money, no whammies. I gotta hold this pose for a long time. This takes forever to log in. Ah, unknown. But, but it should be known. I guess it is possible that uh, this being XP embedded, it doesn't include all of the standard Windows drivers now that I think about it. Yeah, it looks like uh, msdv.inf is missing, and that is the DV driver. And it looks like uh, the driver included with this is only for IIDC. It's funny, because I have an Apple iSight somewhere, but I have no idea where. All right, well, this is a sad day for Cardassia. It, uh, it doesn't work. It, it was a valiant effort. I went and found out all the files that are used uh, for the, the standard DV driver on Windows XP, it's built in, so there's no reason for anybody to write down what files they are. So I had to dig through all the INFs, uh, and I brought over those and all the sys files and whatnot, and uh, just brought, plunked them in here, and um, it recognized the camera immediately and installed it. You can see it's right there, and it doesn't work. If I try to touch it, Explorer just crashes. This thing can't see it. I think at this point, I'm a cut bait. Oh, <laughs> video preview fail. You know... Uh, I'll bet the problem is I've got the FireWire and the DV driver, but I don't have the rest of the Windows Direct Show interface. That's that's probably the problem. If I installed like a full fat copy of Windows XP on here, it would probably fix this, and maybe I'll do that later, but not right now. What we need to do right now is to take the machine apart, uh, see the guts, see how it's put together, uh, but that sounds suspiciously like work, and I've been working too hard for too long, so for the moment, uh, let's make like Bringus Studios and do some ill-advised gaming. 
This thing definitely doesn't want to be a game machine, but Matrox made the poor choice of putting a 3D accelerator in it, and while I have no doubt that it would fall over at the very sight of 2001's top hits, I'm sure we can squeeze some solid classics out of it. Uh, so first off, we've got Unreal Tournament. I mean, that's, well, it's the only game I ever bother running on old computers, usually. And this is the good one, the original one, UT99. Except, this one's not so good. Not a valid Win32 application. Now, I don't know exactly what's causing this. Works fine on my other PC. Uh, so I suspect that the fan patch I installed has some x64-specific code in it. Um... The GitHub doesn't say that, but uh, what do they know? Uh, and there is an XP version of the patch, so I'm going to try installing that. All right, big money, no whammies. Da! Oh, you know what? Uh, this patch assumes that you have XP SP3, and we have... <laughs> oh, no, I think that's SP0. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hang on, look at an older version of the patch. All right, I installed the game fresh. Let's give it a shot. A Ooh, that looks nice and smooth. Let's uh, get into a game here. Oh, right. Oh, man, the default controls for this aren't even WASD. There we go. Wow, this is looking pretty good. You know, I think uh, V-Sync is probably on because I'm getting exactly 60 frames per second. What resolution are we at? Oh, okay, 640 by 480, that'll do it. Let's uh, pump it to 1024. You know, it's interesting, this thing seems to be limited to 1024 by 768. My computer did better than that, like, two or three years before this. Although, uh, oof, uh, <laughs> at this resolution, we're definitely not getting 60. That's, uh, well, it's a nice, clean 30, though. That was super playable back in the day. This was my UT experience, you know, um, back in 99, 2000. And honestly, if we uh, switch this to 800 by 600, uh, I'll bet we'll get that clean uh, 60 again. Mm, well, it's not clean. <laughs> it kind of varies. Uh, but that's that's really not half bad at all. I mean, given that it's it's not supposed to be a game machine, right? I looked at some benchmarks for a G450 based graphics card, and um, I don't remember what the Unreal Tournament uh, bench said, but what I do remember is that both the GeForce 2 and the GeForce 1 absolutely wiped the floor with this thing. Like, I think it was about twice the performance, but I think that was in Quake 3, uh, which raises a good point. At the time this came out, the two benchmarks were basically uh, this and Quake 3. So, this is doing alright. I would definitely have played on this, uh, but I don't think Quake 3 fares as well. Oh, there's also some Z-buffer nonsense going on there. I don't think that's an engine limitation. I think that's actually the card having trouble. And that would not particularly surprise me. This was the era of cards with, um, let's say, interesting implementations of DirectX. Anyway, let's see how Quake 3 does. So this is interesting. I'm not sure what changed, but the last time I tried this on here, it was running quite a bit worse. Like, uh, I'm talking, um, I was I was getting like 30 FPS tops on this level. It really seems like something I did while um, prepping this for the second take of this video uh, significantly improved the performance. I mean, this isn't what it should be. This feels like it's less than a, a consistent 60, and there's really no excuse for that at 640 by 480. But still, it's doing better than it was before. I'm honestly not sure what changed, because the last time I played this, there was a really severe keyboard lag for some reason. The mouse was fine, but the keyboard had like a good quarter second of delay. And uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm doing fine now. Let's um, try it at uh, 1024. Wow, yeah, the last time I tried this, I was getting like a 20-odd FPS, but this is uh, more than playable. Well, okay, it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty variable, actually. Ooh, that's like a crunchy 15. But all the same, I, I gotta give it a badge of approval for um, the, the machine you game on because Dad brought it home from work when they threw it out. Uh, this would be more than adequate. Although I guess, um, now that I think about it, I am wondering if this actually has enough cooling to handle serious gaming, because uh, that one fan, that one little sink, hmm, I don't know. This uh, this thing might decide to reball itself at any moment. So, it would probably be advisable, <laughs> damn it, uh, if we were to move on in the video. So, we've uh, stretched those gamer muscles. It's time to get back to work. Oh, ooh, let's see if it does it again. There's a fun thing that happens when I shut this down. It is now safe to turn off your computer. 
for some reason this thing doesn't implement the um the acpi or or apm or whatever it is uh command that shuts the machine down weird right i guess it could have been disabled when they built the um the image uh, for xp embedded or it could be disabled in the bios on this thing deliberately i don't know but um <laughs> i can't remember the last time i saw that screen anyway though let's uh get to tearing this thing apart Opening this thing is a mild pain, or at least a little confusing. There's only two obvious screws. And with those off, no nothing happens. Now you might flip it over and find these screws. Don't take those out. I'll explain why later. In fact, we need to take off all of these jack screws, but not those ones. You'll see why later. And with all those out, it, um... Oh, actually, okay. It was easier that time. The first few times I took this apart, you see these little dimples here? They really grab up at the front, especially because there's uh, matching dimples underneath. So this was really in there, and I had to uh, get my favorite screwdriver to wedge it apart. But uh, I guess I've done it enough times that sort of loosened it up. Anyway, um, with that open, you can see... There's a cable on the parallel port. You just unplug that. That's why you don't have to take those jack screws out. All right, so here's our computer. It's pretty dense in here. They really used every single cubic inch of internal space. And I'll show you shortly just how true that is. Uh, but first off, we've got the uh, two and a half inch hard drive over here, which is mounted in an adorable little two drive cage consisting just of these little metal tabs. Uh, fun fact though, half the screws are on the outside of the case. So someone who's trying to figure out how to get this puzzle box open could decide to unscrew those. And if the others didn't get installed, then the hard drives just go tumbling around inside the chassis. Terrific. <laughs> That's a pretty silly nitpick, but I will stand behind this one. Uh, you can't remove this ribbon cable <laughs> without unscrewing the drive and taking it out. Like, uh, okay, I guess there really is no extra room here. There's not a millimeter to spare, so this was unavoidable, but um, still... Another thing about that, though, uh, so this cable plugs into one of these little tiny 44-pin headers on the board, and there's two of them. Now, I've talked about this before, there's no reason they couldn't have made this a two-plug ribbon, a uh, three-plug, right? This one, that one, and then another one right there, because they know this is exactly where the other drive will be, and it would take up less space than two cables. But I have a theory. You see this four-pin header? I have the suspicion, and I keep forgetting to meter this out, that that is a uh, standard floppy-style power plug, uh, like you often see in these little machines for hooking up uh, internal hard drives and whatnot. But the two-and-a-half-inch drives are powered off the cable, so what do we need this for? CD-ROM. If you needed to reload the OS, uh, in the days before USB CD-ROMs were, you know, commonplace and, and you could regularly boot off of them, uh, it might have made the most sense to open this up and just plug in a normal drive with a 40-pin adapter, but you'd need to get the power from somewhere. And if they're including a second port just for that purpose, then why bother making a three-plug ribbon? Just ship the customer another one of these. Yeah. But let's see if that really is a power connector, because I keep forgetting to check. There's our 12. There's our 5. So yeah, that's exactly what it is. Now, moving on to the board itself, the uh, first thing you might notice is a couple of these uh, funny little heat sinks with the round pins. Now, these show up in industrial devices a lot, and I always meant to figure out why, because, well, I figured they must cost a fortune to make. Uh, your typical PC heat sink has straight fins, and that means it can be extruded, which is an incredibly inexpensive process. You just push metal through a die, and you're done. You get a big, long sink, you cut it to length, you're ready to go. With these, on the other hand, I always figured these had to be machined because uh, the surface finish on here is mirror-like. So these can't be cast. Um, it's way too clean for that, and you can't extrude this shape. But well, it doesn't make any sense to like get a billet and spend all this time going around every single one of these pins with an end mill. It, yeah, gibberish. So I finally looked it up. I knew there had to be an explanation. Of course there is. I should have done this years ago. It turns out these are actually really, really cool. Uh, see, a straight fin sink is only effectively cooled by air flowing in one direction, but round pins are cooled by airflow in any direction, or changing direction, or chaotic airflow. And that makes sense, because what do we have here? This little tiny cramped box. It's only got one fan. It's partly blocked by two different PCBs. And the fan is focused primarily on the CPU, which uses conventional straight fins. So it catches a lot of that air and it just sort of gets um, 
uh, channeled out this vent over here. Uh, these sinks get the dregs. It's whatever splashes off here or, you know, comes out this side of the fan and sort of meanders over here. They need all the help they can get. And as for how these are made, turns out they're cold forged. I mean, of course they are. I don't know why I never thought of that. You just press a die down over a lump of aluminum. It's cheap, it's quick, and you get this beautiful surface finish. Now you know. Free tuning forks, too. Oh, um, speaking of metalworking, do you happen to notice the uh, bottom of this plate? It's got this sort of rainbowy yellow purple thing going on. I was always curious about this also. You see this a lot on industrial stuff, especially uh, like old mainframe components, things like that, but very rarely on consumer hardware, other than the occasional three and a half to five and a quarter uh, hard drive bracket. And for the longest time, I didn't know what it was or why it wasn't used more. It looks beautiful, if you ask me. Well, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is a thing called a uh, zinc chromate. Uh, it's basically standard galvanization, so a, a layer of zinc, and then a layer of zinc chromate over top that gives us this color. Uh, this is rare in consumer stuff and increasingly rare in general use nowadays because naturally it is toxic as all get out and carcinogenic to boot. So now you know, or, or you don't know because maybe that's not what it is, uh, but uh, it, that, all that stuff is true for zinc chromate. I just don't know if that's zinc chromate. It looks like it. All right, all right, so what do we have here? Well, I think it's a motherboard. Right, right, but let's look at some chips. Uh, so we've got our VIA uh, VT82C686B. That's your south bridge. That's pretty much all your IO. So uh, it's your sound card, your USB, your floppy controller, IDE, serial, parallel, the works. Pretty much everything goes in or out of this board. Uh, and that just leaves the graphics. The uh, G450 will be under one of these pin sinks, and then the other one will be the north bridge. And I'm going to guess that's this guy, because right next to the other one is this, which is a Samsung 128 megabit uh, DDR RAM module. That is 16 megabytes, if I did my basic arithmetic right. And I'm sure that's VRAM, because if we take a look at the system RAM here... Well, I already told you, uh, it's PC100. This is a single data rate. You can tell from the two notches. This is a Pentium 3 machine, as you saw. Uh, as far as I know, those were all S... In fact, I'm sure those were all SDR because um, even the early Pentium 4s used RDRAM at first, and then briefly they went to SDR because of cost issues, uh, and then DDR finally became available like a year or two later. All right, a couple more things. Uh, this chip here is socketed. Its socketedness tells me that's the BIOS. Uh, this Cypress chip here, that one is the clock source for the AGP graphics interface. And... Um, that's almost everything of any significance on the board. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the uh, the Intel Ethernet controller, uh, which is kind of interesting because that's probably an integrated uh, Mac and PHY, uh, which means the actual twisted pair signal comes out of this chip because I don't see any other you know PHY on here. Uh, this would be the uh, optocoupler or the magnetics, I can't remember which, for uh, the RJ45 jack, but that means this is pushing the full fat uh, twisted pair Ethernet signal under all this other stuff on the board to exit. That's... I think that's pretty normal, but uh, I just never really thought about it. But anyway, that's pretty much everything on here, except, of course, for a Xilinx. <laughs> Can't have any industrial machine without a Xilinx of some stripe. Uh, now, I usually assume these are FPGAs. This one turns out to be a CPLD. Uh, the distinction doesn't really matter because in both cases, it just means we have no idea what it does. But I have some speculation that I'll share in a bit. We're going to want to take a look at the digital I.O. pretty soon. But first, I'd like to talk about the reason I bought this machine in the first place. You can see it. It's right in front of you. Some will have picked up on it already because it's our new old friend, PC-104. Uh, now I talked about this in the last little guys and I made a mistake, which I'm now going to correct. PC-104 is a system of tiny PC compatible parts for building your own custom little guys. Uh, the motherboards and the add-on peripherals are all exactly this size and everyone has this uh, pattern of four mounting holes, which you'll notice we have here and there. Uh, you'll also notice, however, these two sockets. These are how the boards interconnect. So you can build a system by just stacking these on top of each other, and then they all uh, assemble into a single bus. Now, these are standard PC-compatible interfaces. The uh, top slot is uh, just PCISA. Now, if it were just the lower strip, uh, as we see here, that's 8-bit ISA. 
But since it's both, that means it's 16-bit, and that's what I got wrong. I thought this was called a PC-104+. Plus. That term actually refers to this plug down here, which is standard 32-bit PCI. Ostensibly, they call this plus because it has the ISA plus the PCI. Of course, Wikipedia also claims there's something called PCI-104 with no plus, and that one only has the PCI. I have beef with that, though. Yeah, it's confusing, but also they should have called it PC-104 plus minus. Anyway, anyway, uh, I bought this thing because uh, 104 machines are hard to find for good prices and they're incredibly hard to hook up. Um, I've got like this guy here, but I don't have any of the cables for it. It needs all these little tiny um, dip cables, so I can't plug in a keyboard, a mouse, video. I don't even know where to put the power. Uh, now, a couple people have offered to send me boards with cables, but they're not here yet. So when I stumbled across this for $79 on eBay, I thought, great, a normal mini PC. I can just plug it in and use it for whatever. And if I find a neat PC-104 Plus card, I can just pop it in and test it. Well, it turns out that's very much on purpose. Uh, this board is not custom. It is a standard design from the PC-104 Consortium. It's called EBX, and it's intended to make it easier to use 104 add-ons without needing to go all in on the form factor. Neato Dorito. But I was disappointed when I received mine because I'd hoped it would actually have some cards. Lots of the units on eBay had stuff inside. More on that shortly. And Matrox encouraged customers to add up to three add-ons. You can see there's just about room in here for three cards. Remember when I said they used every last cubic inch of this damn thing? Yeah, I wasn't kidding. But sadly, mine came empty. Oh well, at least I massively underpaid for the rest of the machine. Now, I'm sure you've noticed these odd sort of um, SCSI-esque connectors hanging out down here, but keep those in mind. We'll come back to them shortly. For the moment, let's just pull out the digital I.O. board and take a look at that. So this comes out with just uh, two screws. And that seems super easy until you go to actually remove it, because uh, it doesn't want to. <laughs> it's, it's jammed through the back panel here. So I tried taking off the back panel earlier. That just complicates things. You have to just sort of um, push it inside and then wedge that side up. And sometimes it leaves this little riser behind. Now I want to show you this little riser because I kind of love and kind of hate this thing. So you've got this socket here and it looks like you need to plug something in right there. And you can actually do that like yay. But what you're supposed to do <laughs> is to shove the pins through these vias on the back of the board and they'll go up through the socket. I've seen these before. Um, it's a mezzanine connector. It's very commonly used. Uh, you'll see this a lot on like old hard drives and things like that, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't like it. So like I said, digital IO pins can act as either inputs or outputs. So uh, this board has 16 copies of both types of circuitry. So the uh, larger chips here, those are AQV212s. I looked those up. They're solid state relays. Remember earlier uh, we found that the pins get connected together when you turn an output on. Uh, so these are uh, replacing a mechanical relay with switch closures. So there's a couple of like transistors in there uh, to ensure that you can pass uh, both DC and AC signals, I'm sure. Uh, now these are interesting because they're internally opto isolated, uh, which makes them much more resilient to uh, you know high voltage coming in. Again, uh, if somebody puts you know 150 volts into this, uh, if an external like relay with a coil uh, the magnetic field collapses and pushes a big burst of power through the thing. It's not going to fry the motherboard, just this board. I'm sure this board cost three or four hundred dollars to replace, but that beats, you know, five grand for the whole unit. And next to those, we've got these, which are just simple opto isolators. And I believe that that handles the entire input half. Um, so when you put a, a signal in here, it just turns on an LED inside the opto isolator. Uh, and then the other side can be read as a um, high or low logic level. And that's it. That's the whole thing. The rest of the stuff on here is just simple logic. These are like AND gates and whatnot. There's no intelligence, no microcontroller, nothing. And of course, the port this plugs into is just a handful of pins, not nearly enough to be ICE or PCI or anything, and there's nothing on the module to speak those languages. So I'm sure this is nothing more than just a set of logic lines that controls the circuitry on this board. Something else has to be doing that controlling, and my guess is that's what this CPLD is for. Um, this is advanced enough that it can talk I don't know, ISA, maybe I2C or SM bus, something like that. Um, just enough intelligence to turn some pins on and off. Or maybe it's better than that. I don't know. Somebody will tell me in the comments. Uh, but uh, the point is, that's all the circuitry on the entire thing. 
and you notice what's missing is any sort of video hardware. There's no analog digital converter, no nothing. Well, uh, remember all those video formats that I mentioned earlier, like LVDS and Camera Link? Well, um, those use funky plugs like this, which are obviously not present on the device, but this rear cutout can be removed. And indeed, if we look on eBay, we find other foresights, which replace that with a camera link port or an aux IO port, whatever that is, or even a second Orion interface. So I guess you could do uh, 24 cameras on one machine. Uh, so that's neat, but uh, well, how do they connect to the machine? Obviously they can't go through this port. It, it just connects to the CPLD and there aren't enough pins for all that. And that I think brings us back to these funky connectors here. These puzzled me at first because, well, I figured whatever plugged into those, it would have to block the PC-104 slot. So how's all that work? Well, after I concluded that the capture card must not be present, it wasn't just hiding on the back of the motherboard or something, um, I went and looked it up a little more. And sure enough, this appears to be the Orion card and it is a PC-104 module with extra plugs that seat into those. And we can guess that these carry the analog signals from the port on the back or, or, or digital, whatever, right? That's um, probably 22 and 22 pins, <laughs> okay? Uh, so those come in, the board digitizes the signals and then it spits them out over the uh, PCI bus. And of course, as long as you install that card first, you can still install two more 104 modules on top of it. That's pretty neat. And I'm hoping I'll eventually get one of those boards so I can get this thing going. But there are two more quick things I'd like to show you before we call it quits and both require removing the board. Uh, first, I'd like to show you the uh, power inlet board because that's a weird little thing, but you can't really uh, see that without pulling the whole motherboard out. And I want to show you what's on the back of the motherboard anyway. So uh, first things first, we're going to remove the uh, PC-104 standoffs. So that's the wrong bit. Oh, and um, I should mention, these are rusty. And in fact, the uh, screws from the outer case are also... It's hard to see, but they're also a little bit rusty. So this must have been in a, a somewhat humid environment. Either that or maybe um, people were using like um, water or solvents to clean the uh, production line uh, and they just kept getting misted, like picked up by the fan and blown into the chassis. I don't know. Uh, but it couldn't have been too wet because the rest of this thing looks fine. Anyway, we just take out uh, four more screws. Or is it three more screws? Oh, right. And then all the jack screws from the back. Okay, and just like that, it comes right out. Oh, and uh, even though they're using standoffs, they actually bothered to put some fish paper in there. Oh, right. Uh, I just realized why, because there's uh, hanger hooks on the back of this, and the uh, fish paper ensures that if those over penetrate a little bit, that they won't short out against the back of the board. Thank you, Matrox. So here's the uh, DC power board with uh, the inlet and the button, but as you can see, it's a very odd shape. Um, obviously it was intended to allow the bulk of the airflow from the fan to go through the middle of it. And I suspect that that's just because they had literally nowhere else in the case to put this board. But it's also possible that it just really needed the cooling. I mean, obviously there's some voltage regulation going on in here because we got these coils and, and some semiconductors. On the other hand, the biggest one is clearly the, this one on the motherboard. So you'd think that would want the lion's share of the air and it's definitely not getting it. It's blocked by um, this down here. And honestly, could this really get hot enough to justify blocking like 40% of the airflow of the rest of the machine? Well, I mean, I guess it could because if we take a look at the connector here, there's obviously some heat damage there. <laughs> you can see the plastic is a little brown. Uh, and this is probably really hard to see on the camera, but this part of the board has actually expanded. It's actually um, uh, swelled uh, due to overheating. So they must have under specced these pins just a little bit. Anyway, though, uh, the last thing to look at is the back of the board, and there's not a whole lot going on here, but I found a couple notable things. First, we've got another 16 megs of RAM, so I guess this thing has 32 megs of dedicated VRAM. That's actually pretty impressive uh, for being embedded graphics for the era. Uh, then we've got these two Texas Instruments chips. Those turn out to be the FireWire ports. Uh, for some reason, I guess FireWire splits the controller into a host controller and a transceiver. I have no idea why. And also these are three port devices and I don't know why it would be three rather than two or four. Maybe some underlying bus speed limitation. I don't know. Finally, we've got uh, these two chips here. The first one is an RS-232 serial port controller. The second one is an RS-485 controller. And at first I thought, okay, let's COM1 and COM2. But wait a minute. 
Ah, these are probably both COM2. Remember the BIOS lets you select the protocol on that port, but not the other one? Uh, see, the Super IO chip, it's got its own RS-232 interfaces, so probably one of those is connected to COM1, but they found that if they hooked the second one up to COM2, there was no way to switch that off in order to inject the uh, RS-485 controller. So I think these are both hooked up, and uh, when you switch modes in the BIOS, it just turns off the chip select on one and turns it on on the other. Just a guess, though. And with that last morsel of minutia, we're done. I hope that was a rip-roaring good time for all. Was for me, at least. This is one of the more adorable machines I've gotten for this series. It knows exactly what it's about, and it served a very specific and, well, to me, intriguing purpose. It packed Quaker oats. Ooh. And, you know, it's also kind of fired my interest in machine vision. I mean, not that I have a serious interest in it. I just don't understand math well enough for that. But I have always been fascinated by the concept. And now it seems like there might be relatively easy authoring systems out there. So I hope someday I'll find a machine with tools intended for clueless bumblers so I can rig up my troll doll identification line here on the bench and for some reason share that with you. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to thank you for watching this video. I had a good time shooting it. I hope you had a good time viewing it. And if you're new to my channel, hey, how's it going? I do this all the time, so consider subscribing if you want to see more of the same. Remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new stuff. But if you want to help me out and make sure I can continue making stuff like this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing. This is my full-time job. They're the only reason I can afford to buy uh, silly gadgets like this on eBay and whatnot and to buy food, and to put gas in my car, and pay my rent, and so on, so I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for making this possible. Thank you all so much, and to everyone else, thanks for watching.